Good to see everyone this morning. Welcome to all those online. If you're online, go ahead and if you're blessed by something today, hit the like button and also subscribe. That just helps to spread it to more people. Uh, if you're watching on your TV or even if you're in the room here, you can still bring up the app on your phone and hit like and hit subscribe. We want to get the word out to more people and that just helps boost it to people. So uh, think about doing that. Uh, we're in uh, week two of this series, The Lion and the Dragon. We're doing, uh, last week we started with angels. If you missed that, that's on our YouTube channel, on iTunes podcast. Check it out there. Today we're doing demons. Next week we'll be doing judgment. And then we'll be doing paradise. In the book of Revelation, it tells us that Jesus is in this apocryphal image depicted as a lion. He's not a lion, but that imagery is very apt for the magisterial nature of Jesus. Also, Satan is described as a dragon. He's not a dragon, but again, that imagery is apt for describing his evil ways. As I said last week, because we're in a skeptical culture, some of these concepts can be hard for us to grasp. Some people have no problem with the supernatural. Some people have many experiences of supernatural things and have no problem understanding what the Scripture teaches about this. But I will say this can be a particular challenge for some. And just very quickly, I'll, I'll do it more brief than I did last week, but uh, one road in, from a secular, skeptical place into understanding the spiritual reality of, of Scripture is uh, actually to lean into the idea of the multiverse, which is a, a secular, non-Christian, really, uh, scientific view of the world that says that there's a, a variety of, of, of infinite amounts of universes where everything that could happen does happen. And so because of that, there must exist a universe where everything in the Bible is true. It's not there could exist because there's an infinite, unending amount of variations of everything that can exist. Therefore, they must exist. Therefore, there is a universe where everything in the Bible is true. And I'm here today to tell us that that's the universe we're in right now. So demons and angels, the two sides of the same coin. We're going to be reading from Luke chapter 4, verse 31. Through 37, let me pray and then we'll read. Jesus, help us to understand your word today. I pray, set us free from the forces of darkness. Help us to not be skeptical and to doubt, but help us to, to believe and help us to see spiritual reality. And I pray for those who don't yet believe today, bring them into your family. But Lord, for everyone, set us free from the, the evil works of spiritual forces in the world and in our lives and help us to fight. Help us to fight the good fight. Help us to glorify you as we fight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Here we go. Luke 4, 31. Talking about Jesus. It says, And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee. And he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching. For his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had, a spirit of an, had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. This is God's word. It says the people were amazed at this. There's a few reasons they're amazed. One reason, obviously, is Jesus, and Jesus is amazing. The other reason they were amazed is because the teachers of their day were completely inept and unable to do this kind of thing. So their teaching was weak. They were wishy-washy about what they said. They would, rather than having firm theological convictions, they would always quote other people or be just very philosophical about things. And so they were, there was a big contrast between Jesus and what the people of the religious leaders of the day were saying, but also a big difference in what they were doing. So for example, in Acts chapter 19, if you want to read it, it's a curious passage, there's a story of some itinerant Jewish teachers of the day trying to perform an exorcism on this person. And this person 
strips the people of their clothes, beats them up, and they run away in shame. This is the experience 2,000 years ago that the, the nation of Israel had of their own leaders, of their inability to deal with demonic evil forces. And so in contrast, they're amazed because Jesus, with a word, has complete dominance and complete power over these dark forces. We're told that throughout Scripture, throughout, bibl throughout biblical history, throughout church history, we're told time and again of these signs and wonders, God doing signs and wonders, performing miracles, healings, deliverances, and exorcisms. And the pur these things have purpose in themselves. They have some purpose in themselves, but they're, they're called signs because they, they point to a message. God does these powerful miracles. Obviously, He wants to bless us. He wants people to be free of suffering and he wants to heal people, wants to do all these wonderful things. But really, they're, they're, they're signposts that tell us about the message that God came, that, that he sent his son to deliver to us. And this is the message that Jesus delivered. This is the message he's delivering in the synagogue. This is the, the message he delivered to people in his teaching ministry. The fact that only through him could people be saved. That he came to substitute himself for our sin. That a righteous life. The only righteous one. God is only God alone is, is holy and righteous the, without sin. His life substituted for our sinful, fallen life. That there's an exchange that happens. And that this exchange that happens, it, it takes place through the death of Jesus on the cross, through his resurrection then from the tomb as well into new life that we're crucified. Our sin is crucified with him on the cross. And then as he raises to life out of the tomb, we raise to life with him. And this is the beauty of the message is it's a free gift to us. This is what's so crucial about the message that Jesus came to declare to us, that he's teaching, that his disciples, his apostles taught, that we teach, is that this is a free gift. It's by faith. You receive it by faith, but it's, it's not of works, so that no one can boast. It's by the work of God, not by our work. And it's such a crucial message. It's the only message that can change the human heart. It's the greatest miracle, actually, of all the signs and all the miracles you could ever see. The human heart being transformed from being devoted to evil and being bent towards evil and towards resisting God, being transformed to be some, a heart that actually desires the ways of God and desires the things of God, that's the greatest thing that could happen. And that's the healing and that's the salvation and that's the miracle our world needs, which explains why there's so much opposition to it. It explains when Jesus came with this message, there's this explosion of demonic activity. When you, when you, when you declare the gospel message, you suffer for it. I mean, it bears fruit as well. It can, of course, it bears fruit because God's at work in the world, but we suffer for it as well because of the, the great opposition that we experience as we declare this message and as Jesus declared this message. So in the synagogue, this man stands up and he, he, says, to he says these bizarre things to Jesus. And the, the Bible tells us that this man has a demon, a spirit that's called an unclean demon, an unclean demon. It doesn't mean that that particular fallen angel that day didn't do a good job with his cleaning regimen. He had some body odor. In contrast to angels, unfallen angels, that stand before God, we looked at that last week, they're referred to as holy ones because they're before God. They're clean. They're moral. So unclean spirits, demons, they're called that because they are corrupted. They're morally corrupt. Just like we might say somebody has a, a dirty mind or filthy language. We're saying these demons, they're morally corrupt, they're filthy, they're, they're unclean in that way. Many phrases the Bible uses to describe demons, obviously unclean spirits, evil spirits, deceitful spirits, sometimes just spirits, harmful spirits as well. They're referred to as cosmic powers. The Apostle Paul refers to them as the present darkness and the spiritual forces of evil. In one encounter in the New Testament, when Jesus is talking to a de demonized person, the, the, the spirits refer to themselves as legion. We're told that there's a spirit of divination. We're told there's a lying spirit. There's a disabling spirit. Different spirits mentioned throughout Scripture. Even the Pharisees of the day referred to Satan as the prince of demons. Now, that's only... The prince idea is only really used in one other place, but that's technically a, a, a true description, a technically a true title to give Satan, that he is the chief demon. He is simply the leader of 
fallen angels, the most powerful angel, in fact. Elsewhere, he's referred to, of course, as the devil, the serpent, the dragon, the Elzebul. He's also called the ruler of this world. Even in one place, strangely, he's called the god of this world, lowercase g. He's called the prince of the power of the air. It's a very strange statement, but the, to be the prince of the power of the air, the, that word air there is it's a hard word to, to translate, but essentially what it means is it, it's saying that Satan has power over the spiritual atmosphere of our reality, of this physical world that we live in. He's the ruler of it. He's also referred to as the evil one. We're told he's an accuser, that he's a tempter, he's a thief and a liar and the father of all lies, that he's a murderer, that he's a devourer, that he's a deceiver. The name Lucifer that we're is commonly believed to be his angelic name uh, before he fell, unfortunately is a poor translation of the Latin. So in the book of Isaiah, uh, in some older translations of the Bible, especially in King James would be one example of this. Sorry to burst anyone's bubble about their love of the King James version. It's a decent version, but it got some things wrong. And we have much better uh, analysis of, of uh, biblical text now. But unfortunately, it was a bad translation into Latin to use the word Lucifer to describe um, one who brings light, the bringer of light. In the ESV, it talks about it being the day star. And they thought that it was the name of a Babylonian king, and so they capitalized it as Lucifer. And so when people read it in the English, they thought it was a proper name. So they said, oh, that's Satan's name before he was a fallen angel, Lucifer, but that's wrong. Even if it wasn't wrong, um, it would be inappropriate to refer to him as Lucifer because he is no longer an angel of light. He's a fallen, deceptive creature. The name that's used the most is the name Satan. It's the name Satan. Satan means adversary. Satan means adversary. He is God's adversary. He opposes all that God stands for and all that God does. And then by association, we are also his adversaries as well. We don't know when it happened. We don't know the history of it. It's, there's a lot of mystery to this. Hopefully one day we'll get more insight into this. But at some point in history, there was some kind of insurrection, some type of conflict between Satan, whatever his name, his angelic name was before he was Satan, and his crew of angels. And there was some conflict in the heavenly places. It, it would have happened sometime between the final time of period of creation, the seven days. You know, God created the earth in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. And he said, everything's good. It's all good. So we know there was no evil at that point. And then between then and when the serpent comes in to tempt humanity, sometime in that time period, we don't know how long that period is. Could be a short period, could be a long period, we don't know. Doesn't appear that Adam and Eve had any kids. So who knows how long that period is exactly. But at some point, there was this heavenly insurrection and this vast group of angels fell and were banished from the heavenly places. Banished. We're told in the book of Job, in fact, that Satan, this is self-reported, so it's probably a lie or probably a twisting. of the, Anything Satan says, is you can, you can be pretty sure there's something, even if it's partially true, there's a lie going on. But he, he self-reports that he's walking around on the earth, walking up and down, just checking things out, obviously excluding all of the evil, twisted things that he's up to. We're also told in the book of Job, very fascinating, that the angels gather, present themselves, not fallen angels, the holy ones, gather before God, and it appears that Satan is able to join them and presents himself to God, and they have a conversation. Now, that might seem bizarre to us. Say, how can you do that if you're banished, if you're evil? How would God not know? How? There's a lot about the spiritual realm we don't understand. We can't really comprehend. And even the spiritual realm that exists now, and even this earth, it's all, there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. So, all of that's going to change and be different again anyway. There's a lot that we don't understand, but it doesn't mean it's not true. Satan seems to be able to present himself towards God and, and converse in this way. Even though Satan is very powerful, we also can understand this, that because he has fallen, because demons have fallen, and because they're corrupted by sin, and because they've been cursed, it's really reasonable, well, we, we know this is true, that the forces of good are more powerful than the forces of evil. Christians know that. And so from that, we can really be confident that demons, because they're fallen, because they're cursed, because they're corrupted by sin, because they're unclean, that they are less, now less powerful 
than angels. They are now less powerful than angels. It's a little bit of an assumption, but it's a very reasonable thing to conclude. Even with that, we cannot and should not deny or be foolish about the, the, the level of power they do have because their influence and impact in the world and on people's lives has been devastating. I mean, you think about it. It was a demon, the chief demon, that caused an eternal split in the heavenlies amongst the angels. It was a demon, the chief demon, again, who tempted the human race that fell away from God and then brought a curse on all of creation. It was a demon who made fire fall from the sky and kill all of Job's servants at once. That's a lot of power. It was a demon that influenced King Saul to try and murder David. It was a demon that entered Judas, and then Judas that portrayed Jesus. It was a demon that thwarted the Apostle Paul's missionary activity. And in Acts 19, as I said earlier on, it was a demon that basically stripped these people of their clothes, beat them up, and left them running. Demons have caused countless sicknesses. They've caused people to, to believe in deceitful religions, false religions. They've caused Christians to doubt God. We cannot underestimate, even though their power is not as powerful as the forces of good, we cannot underestimate their power, and we have to understand we're in a battle, we're in a fight, and the forces of darkness have to be thwarted, have to be confronted, have to be stopped. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, it tells us, it says, The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of evil. Interestingly, in this synagogue situation in Luke chapter 4, what is it that the unclean spirit says through this man? He says, have you come to destroy us? See, fallen angels are aware that there's a cosmic conflict between them and, and God. They're aware of it. They're aware that there's this adversarial nature and that if they see the work of Jesus, they know we're up for a fight. Something's happening here. But they're deceived to think that they can win because they continue to fight. They continue their mission and their purpose. They're deceived. They really think, they must think that they can win. They must think that they know the future or that they can understand or outwit God. What's incredible to think about is in the Old Testament, leading up to, this, to the ministry of Jesus, we do see supernatural activity. We're told of angels. We're told at different times that there are demons. That we see healings and even a resurrection. And you see these things happen in prophecy. You see all these supernatural things you know, from time to time happening. But with the coming of Jesus, you see all those things as well. But you see an explosion of exorcisms that never happened in the Old Testament. So what's happening is, it's not like suddenly they've appeared out of nowhere. They weren't there before. They were always there. But with the coming of the Son of God, with good coming into the world, the greatest good becoming flesh and coming into the world, it was a direct confrontation of the forces of darkness. And in that conflict, the good has to win. God, has, God must win. And the demons flee. And they even, I mean, they even announce themselves. You know, they, 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 they don't wait to be found out. They, they just, they're aware that Jesus is there. They're aware that power is there. They're aware that something's, they're aware that he's the Holy One of God. And so they speak up. They, they realize we're in trouble. This is a fight. And so they start fighting. Never before had this been seen in Israel. Never before had this been seen in, in Christian and in, in Jewish history. This explosion of demonic activity. The apostle Paul says in, in Corinthians, he even says that people who make sacrifices to idols and to false gods, so people of the day, you know, people make their idol, they fashion their idol, they have this God they believe in and this God they believe in, and they make their sacrifices, they burn their different foods, or whatever they do, they make their sacrifices to their idols. He says, even if people don't realize what they're doing, they're worshiping demons. That is what they're doing. And the Old Testament makes it explicitly clear. In uh, Psalm 106, verse 37, Psalm 106, 37, it says, of some of the, the nations in the Old Testament, it says, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. To the demons. Now, this really actually reframes 
some of our understanding of the Old Testament. Because our generation, there are things in the Old Testament that we really don't like. We, we read them, we're really troubled by them. So some of the wars, some of the conflict that happens there in the Old Testament, we read it and we're like, oh, that doesn't sound good. That doesn't sound like nice Jesus. Um, and so, you know, we understand like, well, the Philistines sound bad and they're attacking. So if you've got to defend yourself, okay, you can defend yourself. But God tells the Israelites to attack certain nations at certain times, to destroy them. Now, when we understand what's actually happening here, that that is a physical thing as much as it is a spiritual thing that's happening. Because you have a redeemed people. You have the people of Israel who are in slavery, redeemed by God. Now they've been made a holy nation. They're now devoted to God. They're consecrated for God's purposes, for God's mission in the world. They've received the, the moral law. They've got to share this with the world. They've got to live it out and be obedient to God. And they failed time and time again. But they've been redeemed, they've been a holy nation, and now they're encountering other nations that are controlled by demons. People making, sacrificing their children to these demons. Sometimes people are aware they were doing it, sometimes people are just thinking they're worshipping false gods. When you understand this is a spiritual thing, just as much as it is a physical thing, it actually helps you understand what's happening in those contexts. So this is the kingdom of light coming against the kingdom of darkness. Now, you might say, Matt, 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 doesn't it say in the Scripture that our battle is not against flesh and blood? It says our battle is not against flesh and blood. And that's true. But you know what? We misunderstand that passage. It is true. That's obviously a true statement. But here's what we've got to understand as well. In Ephesians 2, verse 2, chapter 2, verse 2, it says about the evil one, it says it is a, he's the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. We're in a spiritual battle the forces of darkness and the forces of light are in conflict with one another. And so, yes, our battle is not really against people. So we understand that when we have conflict with people, it's not really about them. But here's what we have to understand is Satan and demons are influencing people. And so we will have conflict, spiritual conflict, that manifests itself through the people we know. It doesn't always do that. There are other ways that we're attacked. But it will also do that, which means sometimes that conflict will manifest itself between people. There's a, so there's a nuance there, nuance there and understanding that, yes, our battle is not against those people, it's against the forces behind that, but it's coming through those people. We have to face up to this spiritual battle that we're in. We can't deny it. We can't avoid it. We can't be chickens about it. We have to, we have to stand up with courage and understand that we can't ignore this battle that we're in, where Jesus has come to destroy the works of the devil. Three ways that we can fight demons. Three ways that Christians can fight demons. Firstly, we must be vigilant. We must be vigilant. Again, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, tells us this. 1 John 4, 19 says, He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And then also Ephesians We've got those passages that can come up. Ephesians 4.26 says, Give no opportunity to the devil. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one and give no opportunity to the devil. Every day that we wake up, before we wake up, there are spiritual forces that are plotting and scheming our demise, plotting and scheming our discouragement, plotting and scheming to destroy us, to harm us, to inflict us, to divide us, to hurt us, to take glory away from God. This is not a happenstance thing. This is not coincidence. This is an active effort that is always happening every single day, conflict happening. We have to be on guard, that we are targets. We're targets to take away glory from God, to, dis to discourage and dissuade the purposes of God, that we are targets. So we have to be aware. You know what? That thought I'm having, well, that might be a spiritual attack. That may not be coming from me or from God or from any good place. That might be a spiritual attack. Or that word that that person spoke against me. Or that thing that that person said that's really heavy and weighing on me. Or you know what? That might not really be that person. That might be a spiritual force working through that person. Or they're using those words against me. We have to wise up to this. That when we're thinking about the worst case scenarios or we're having those imaginary conversations in our minds that are causing more conflict and more discouragement, we have to realize this is, this is the battle. This is part of the battle that we face every single day. Demons are expert liars and deceivers. 
They know how to manipulate us, how to trick us. And so we must become expert detectives, completely wise to their schemes, that we see it for what it is. The second way that we fight demons is that we must be confident. We must be confident. Again, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, it tells us, it says this, this is what I, meant, I read it earlier on, but I want to read it now. It says, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Jesus cast demons out with great confidence and authority, and he called his disciples to do that as well. And we're told that we have the power to do that in the name of Jesus. Jesus did it decisively. He didn't, he didn't play nice. He wasn't rash about it. Or he, he wasn't, but he also wasn't timid about it. He was very forthright about it, and he cast these demons away. Heather and I had an experience several years ago. We, when we moved to Chicago to plant this church, we've been in Chicago a few years at the time, and whenever you try and do something great for God, try and do something on the front lines for God's kingdom, you're going to encounter massive spiritual pushback. Massive spiritual pushback. If you live, you know, people who live kind of a cushy, easy life can tend to wonder, like, you know, where are all the supernatural things supposed to be happening? It's like, well, you experience the supernatural things when you're on the edge of, when, you, when, when you're actually coming up to the battle line and experiencing the conflict directly. So we're experiencing that. We've been under severe spiritual attack in different ways. One night, we went to bed, and we were trying to fall asleep, and uh, Heather, she, she, I hear her very lightly say to me, like, can you, can you pray for me? And she was having a hard time talking, and I was like, what's going on? And she's like, I've got this pressure on my chest. I feel like I'm being pushed down and I can, I'm having a hard time breathing and a hard time talking. And I realized what was happening. I was like, this seems demonic. This seems spiritual. So I took authority over it, cast it away. And at that exact moment when I did that, one of our kids in the room next to us started screaming, just screaming, screaming, screaming. So we ran in and prayed and made sure everyone was okay. What was curious was about a month later, I was in a prayer gathering with some pastors and a guy I'd known for years who I trust and uh, who has shared other things uh, with me that he felt like the Holy Spirit had given uh, to him for me. So he had, had a dream about me not too long ago. And he hadn't shared it with me. He hadn't reached out to me because he, like, he was like, it's a bit of a discouraging dream. So I didn't want to share it with you because I wasn't sure if it was from God or not. But I feel compelled to share it with you. So you be the judge which I appreciated his humility in how he delivered that. Good lesson to all of us if we feel like God's speaking. We've got to be very humble about it because we, we, we're, we're, you know, we can get it wrong. But he's, this is what he saw in his dream. He saw our family in our apartment, and we were surrounded by angels being protected. But then the angels broke rank, and they opened up, and a demon came in and attacked us, and we had to defend ourselves. And then it left, and then the angels went back together, and he said that happened three times. It was three separate times where the angels allowed a demon to come in to attack you and you had to defend yourselves. He's like, I'm really, you know, it's probably not from God. And I had someone else telling me, like, Matt, no, don't receive it. It's not from God. And I was like, no, it is. I know it is because I've already experienced one of these things. Like, clearly. It was like so, it just affirmed what was happening. So I said, okay, God's given us a heads up here. We're under attack. We're, we're, you know, this is, you know, why the angels allow the demons in, I don't know. I'd prefer it if they didn't. You know, that'd be nice. Maybe I could have a word with them. But... I don't know how, I, that's the, is there's so much mystery, so much we don't understand about the spiritual world, but yet we know there's this conflict, and we know that God, you know, whatever Satan and demons do, they're still under the confines of what God allows them to do. I think it was Martin Luther that said that the devil is still God's devil. So we shouldn't fear. But we took, in that moment, in that one moment, and other times, we've had to stand our ground and say we're going to resist this attack. Yeah, church, you know, I've talked to a, all my pastor friends and churches right now, not just in America, but around the world, are, go, are under major spiritual attack, the divisiveness in the church. Our church has been under spiritual attack, the divisiveness coming in. We have to fight it. We have to stand against it. The third way that we fight demons is that we must use the Bible. We must use the Bible. This is how Jesus did spiritual warfare. There's a lot of strange things that people do with spiritual warfare that sound good, but sometimes they're just kooky things that like, you know, I don't know, they're just people being too imaginative or something. It's like, just do it the way Jesus did it. So Jesus was tempted three different times, and even 
are the tempter using Scripture, twisting Scripture to try to compel Jesus to, to, to be tempted. Uh, what did Jesus do every single time? He quoted Scripture back. That's how he fought, was with the Word of God. That's how he fought. We're even warned about the doctrine of demons. The demons are coming up with their own ideas. Sometimes it's the, 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 the twisting of Scripture. Other times it's like demonic things like Marxism or things like that. We're, but we're told that Christians believe the doctrines of, de of, of demons. That, that Christians hear things and it sounds like Scripture, or it sounds close enough to Scripture, and they'll believe it for different reasons and can be deceived. We have to resist it. Let me give a, a shameless plug again for my, my small group. I mentioned this before, but please, if you're, not, if you're not signed up for a small group, you've got to get in a small group. A small group's one of the, the best ways to grow, one of the best ways to grow your faith, to get to know other people. My wife and I are doing this small group this semester called Read the Bible for Life. If you want to be equipped to understand the Bible, to better use the Bible to fight demons, to fight the enemy, join our group or join a different group. Maybe there's a better group for you. Join a group. Get in a group. Learn Scripture. Let's quickly do, look at some things that we can get wrong about demons, some things that we can get wrong about demons. Firstly, we have to be careful how we discern. Go ahead and put that one first point up. <laughs> Demonic activity needs careful discernment. Needs careful discernment. Some cultures and some individuals are too quick to blame the devil for everything. The world itself, human nature itself, the world is cursed. So we know because of the curse, which God cursed it. So because of that, we know there's all kind of trouble going on. But also, human, human flesh, human nature. With, you, know, you take the devil out of the equation, there's still a lot of bad stuff going on. So some, some of us, some people we know, maybe, maybe you do this. I'm sure there are people in our church that do this. Some churches may have a culture where, where this can happen, where everything is over-spiritualized. Everything's a demonic attack. Everything's of the devil. And the, the problem with, with taking this approach is that it discredits us in the eyes of other people because what can happen is we can be blind to our own shortcomings and we can fail to take responsibility for the, for the mistakes we've made and the, 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 the sins we've committed and the trouble we brought on ourselves. And so it's, 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 it actually is kind of immature to just always be blaming the devil. It's always an attack. And it's actually, you know what, I, I kind of created this situation myself and contributed to this. And so the other thing it can, it can reveal in us is just too much, a, too much of an emotional response. We're just being too emotional. We're not really thinking rationally or reasonably about, reasonably about things. So we've got to be careful that we're not over-spiritualizing everything. Now, there may be some people in some cultures and some churches that struggle with that. I would suggest that in our context, our temptation is to probably under-spiritualize things too much because of the skepticism of, of Western cultures and uh, the, the education of our, our society is that we, we tend to under-spiritualize things. We've got to be, we've got to understand, yes, there are some things that are natural, that just happen in the natural world, but there's plenty of stuff as well that is supernatural, and we have to see that for what it is. The key, really, is to take each situation individually and ask individually whatever the situation might be and try to discern which one is it. Not just to assume they're all one way or all a certain the other way. But when we see Scripture being twisted, it should be obvious to us that's demonic. That's the teaching of demons. It's being twisted. When we, see, when we hear a lie coming, we, we, we realize, well, that's satanic. That's, he's the father of lies. You know, when that, that discouraging word comes, we realize, well, that's, that's of the enemy. You know, we've got to, we've got to be, some of these things are obvious, but there's also, we're told, of spiritual gifts that are given in the church. In a few different passages, there's, there's lists of gifts that God gives the body to equip the body to be healthy and be, to be mature. One of the gifts that's talked about is the gift, it's either called the distinguishing of spirits or the discerning of spirits. And what this appears to be, it appears to be that God gives particular people, particular Christians, more maturity and insight into discerning what's of God and what's of Satan. And so for Christians who tend to over-spiritualize or under-spiritualize, those people need to really lean on those who are given this gift to help them get clarity about each individual situation and what it might mean. Because each different situations require different responses. Sometimes we need to submit ourselves to God's sovereign power. We recognize God's in control of this. Other times we realize this is demonic. We have to fight it as hard as we can. Other times this is my flesh that's really doing this. And it takes discerning to do that. 
the Bible is so wise and helpful. In, in the Gospel of, of Matthew, um, I think it's around chapter 4, as he talks about some of the miracles and the works of Jesus, and it says that he healed those who had epilepsy, and then it lists out several things. It lists out epilepsy, and then next to it, it lists out those who were, were set free from demons, those who were demonized. So the Bible itself separates out sometimes a sickness is just a sickness. Sometimes it's just epilepsy. See, people will, will, will criticize the Bible, and they'll say, well, back, you know, people were so kind of barbaric and like cavemen back then, and so they just thought everything crazy that was happening, oh, it's all demonic. But actually, no, the Scripture delineates these things. That sometimes it's just a physical thing. Other times it's an issue of demonization, an oppressive spirit, spirit of infirmity, as it would be called. The second thing that we can get wrong about demons is that we, we think, well, the demons cannot read minds and they cannot predict the future. They cannot read minds and they cannot predict the future. This is important to understand. In the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, the king, he wants his magicians not just to interpret his dreams, but to tell him what one of his dreams was. And they were like, no one, all the magicians were like, no one can do that. Like that's, and the problem is if they, if they fail, then, you know, you know, when you have a monarchy like that, you know, you're in danger of like, you know, you're going to, you're going to bite the dust pretty quickly. So all the magicians are kind of worried. But God reveals uh, to Daniel the dream. Not because Daniel could figure it out, because no one can read minds. Humans can't do it. Demons can't do it. Only God can do it. Jesus, there are examples of Jesus. It tells us in the New Testament, in the Gospels. Jesus knew what they were thinking. That only happens to Jesus. doesn't happen to anyone else. No spiritual gift of mind reading, anything like that. Demons can't do it. They couldn't do it. They didn't know. Now, there are predictions that people will make. People will go see tarot card readers or palm readers or different things, different occult practices, and it, those things can sometimes seem like they're really legit, like someone's given me a prediction of my future. They're telling me something. But it's all an illusion. It's just a cheap magic parlor trick that the very demons that predict these things end up going and doing them in your life. So they predict, oh, something bad's going to happen to you later today, and then they make that bad thing happen to you. So it looks like a prediction. It's just a cheap trick. They can guess. I mean, they can make targeted guesses as well. I mean, just as pe some people are very intuitive, you know, just humans are very intuitive at reading body language and listening to how people communicate or the expression on their face, and they can, like, make good guesses about what's going on on the inside. They don't know for a fact, but some people are really good at this, actually, like, kind of reading people. What makes us think demons can't do that? That they wouldn't be experts at influencing and reading and, and trying to, to target and guess what's going on and appearing to have more power than they actually have. All of this knowledge and this understanding of demons should give us greater confidence that the lies they speak about our worth and the lies that they speak about our destiny and our future have no power. They have no power. It's a parlor trick. It's a parlor trick. And we can fight against it, reject it in the name of Jesus. The third thing, that we can get wrong about demons is that demons can influence Christians. Now, bear with me here. Let me explain this. There's a spectrum of demonization or demon oppression in, in the Bible. So some of the most severe examples of this might be someone having a fit of rage, um, someone having like supernatural physical strength, um, self-harm, hearing voices, even uh, prostitution can be associated with demonic activity, especially cult prostitution. Um, we, we, we read about the sacrificing of the children, right, to, to these idols. Uh, and there's a strong case to be made for today. There's a bit of a parallel there with, like, abortion on demand um, being similar, comparable uh, to that, to being demonic in that nature, which it sounds pretty demonic if you ask me. Those are the most extreme versions on the extreme side of demonic influence. Uh, on the lighter side of things, um, the, the simpler side of things, are the, the things that, that everyone experiences every day of, of, of these negative attacks, these, these lies that come to us, these words that come against us. And that's, that's really the, their main goal is to deceive us and to lie to us. I mean, there, there are times where they, demons will exert like direct power and do counterfeit signs and, and wonders and do these things in the physical world. But really their, their, their power lies in, in the twisting of truth and then the things they want us to believe. So it might be tempting for us to say, well, if someone's a Christian, they can't have any, you know, demons can't really have any control over them, can they? Well, it's actually, it's not entirely clear. There's no, I wish there was a verse that just like spelled it out exactly. You know, you've got to piece some things together here. But consider this, the Apostle Peter, he's an apostle, kind of an important guy. When Jesus predicts his own death, 
Peter tries to talk Jesus out of it. What does Jesus say to him? He says, get behind me, Satan. It appears in that moment that Peter was not speaking the words of God. The Apostle Paul, as well, refers to famously to his thorn in the flesh. We don't know what the thorn in the flesh exactly is, different debates about that. But whatever it is, he refers to it as a messenger sent from Satan. Again, an apostle of God. So we, we have to understand that there is some influence that demons can have in our lives. How powerful that can be, I'm not sure. It seems like the strong grip that demons have in people's lives, like in the synagogue with the man, he stands up, interrupts Jesus, he speaks, legion, these other examples of these really severe kind of demonization, uh, moments of demonization, there's no example of us for us in the, in the New Testament of a, somebody who we know for a fact is a believer experiencing that type of demonization. So because there's no example of that, it probably means those more severe, the more severe end of the spectrum is not re, you know, may not be possible. Again, it's speculative. We don't exactly know. So that's why we need to be vigilant. We need to be closed off to demonic things. We need to fight demonic things. But we know that we can be lied to, that we can even repeat those lies as well, and that, that we can be attacked by demons. Quickly, three responses that we need to have. Three responses. Firstly, we need to get rid of anything demonic in our lives. Anything demonic whatsoever in our lives, we've got to get rid of it completely. So in Acts chapter 19, again, there was this big group of occult following that had like books of occult materials, and these books were very expensive, and they bought them all together and burned them. If you have anything in your life, if you like horoscopes, or you, anything astrology, any kind of fortune telling, that's obviously, you know, God can reveal things, you know, God does reveal the future to us, in the, some things about the future to us in the Bible, and he can give us some guidance in our lives, but the idea of fortune telling, looking into things into the future, we've got to get rid of all of that stuff, palm reading, tarot cards, anything, even if there are things that we're not using, but they're just in our possession, today, burn it, get rid of it, cut it out of your life. You don't need it. But it, there can be things that aren't necessarily occult in their nature, but they have a seductive power over us. They have a demonic power over us. They, they provoke that, that, that lust or that greed or that jealousy or anger or some type of seductive addiction that it has over us. We've got to get it out of our lives and we've got to do it today. Don't play games with it. The second response we've got to have is we have to memorize Scripture. We have to memorize Scripture. I want to give you a verse. Write down this verse reference here, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. This is a very powerful Scripture to memorize to do spiritual warfare because one of the main attacks that's happening against God's church right now is division. And division comes through relationships. And so whenever you're tempted to be divided from a brother or sister in Christ, you fight with this passage. You bring it out, you read it out loud, you pray it out loud, you share it with other people, you post it online, you plaster it everywhere, you write it on your wall, whatever you have to do to get this verse into your heart and to confront demons. It says, put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Most problems I know in Christian ministry that come about in division and conflicts between people is because people are not willing to forgive. And that is demonic in origin. So we have to resist it. We fight it with the word. The third way that we need, need to respond is that we need to grow our faith and grow our prayer our prayer life, to be specific. There are two times that the disciples really struggled to fight demons in the New Testament. Jesus, perfect record of fighting demons, of course he would. The disciples, not always, didn't always do a good job with this. Jesus reveals to them two reasons why. One was their lack of faith. So one thing we have to do is we, have to, we need to start obeying God and all the basic things in our lives, being in his word and following him and being generous and putting his kingdom first. We need to grow our obedience and our faith in God just in general so that our faith can be strong. But there is a particular time where there was a, a very powerful demon that they weren't able to cast out of somebody. And Jesus said, this kind only comes out with prayer. And commentators seem to say that like, oh, that Jesus, Jesus is saying that the disciples' prayer life was inadequate enough to really 
I don't know, give them the, the power they needed to overcome this, this dark force. I don't know exactly know how that works, but that's what Jesus said. And so we need to up our prayer lives. And if there's one thing I know about us American Christians, we are the worst at praying. We stink at praying. We need to learn from, from Eastern Christians, from Christians from other part of the world who know how to pray, know how to do spiritual warfare, know the, the battle that we face. Listen, we should not rejoice that the demons submit to us. We should rejoice that our names are written in the book of life. We should learn about demons, but we should not be enamored with them. We should be enamored with the one who has power over all the demons and who saved us and set us free. Let's respond in words. Let's be enamored with Jesus. Let's have the band come back up and be enamored with Jesus today. If you want to respond, if you need prayer, if you want to follow Jesus for the first time, you want to join a small group, you want to get more plugged in, you want to give today, whatever it might be, go ahead. You can text the word enjoy to 94,000 and you can respond that way. Before we stand up, I want to pray over us. I want to just take a second to stand against the forces of Satan that might be at work in anyone's life, either online or in person. So just, just close our eyes together. I just want to pray. It might be that you feel released. You feel like there's a, something heavy that gets released. It may, be, it may be a mild thing. There may be something more severe. It's okay. We, wanna, we want to be free of whatever darkness might linger in our lives. I'm just going to pray. Take authority over any unclean spirit that's in anyone's life, in this room or watching online. I say you have no power and you must leave in Jesus' name. Your power is broken. The lies are broken. Jesus, we cry out to you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us believe the truth. Let us know that we're your sons and daughters. Help us know our worth and our destiny and help us fight demons. Help us fight with your word. Help us fight with confidence and courage and help us be vigilant that we would be aware that we're in this spiritual battle. Be glorified, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know what feels really good? Hitting that beautiful like button. It's just sitting right there all alone with nothing to do. Help it live to its fullest potential. You know what else feels really good? Embracing that subscribe button. It's like a puppy begging for attention. Just showing it a little bit of love goes a long way. Like and subscribe.